doing 984 to 990 lower back pain and then gonna do osteomyelitis after that so uh, low back pain or back pain in general back pain is one of the most common reasons for visiting a healthcare provider disabling low back pain is the single greatest cause of injury in the working population the lumbosacral or lower back and cervical neck or vertebrae are most commonly affected because these are the areas where the vertebral uh, column is the most flexible Acute back pain is usually self-limiting. If the pain continues for three months or if repeated episodes of pain occur, the patient has chronic back pain. Lumbosacral back pain, low back pain. Pathophysiology. Lumbosacral back pain, referred to as low back pain, LBP, is more common than cervical pain. Acute pain is caused by muscle strain or spasm, ligament sprain, disc, also spelled disc, uh, DISK or DISC, uh, degeneration or herniation of the nucleus pulposus, pul pulposus from the center of the disc. Herniated discs occur most often between the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae, L4 to 5, um, but may occur at other levels. A bulging or herniated nucleus uh, pulposa or HNP in the lumbosacral area can press on the adja adjacent spinal nerve, usually the sciatic nerve, causing severe burning or stabbing pain into the leg or foot. The specific area of pain depends on the level of herniation. Muscle spasms of the affected leg also may occur. In addition to pain, numbness and tingling may be felt in the affected leg uh, because spinal nerves have both motor and sensory fibers. The HNP, or herniated nucleus pulposa, um, may press on the spinal cord itself, causing leg weakness and bowel and bladder dysfunction. Sacral spinal nerves are part of the reflex system of, for the bowel and bladder. They also contain parasympathetic nerve fibers, which help control bowel and bladder function. Back pain may also be caused by spondylos uh, spondylolysis, a defect in one of the vertebrae, usually in the lumbar spine. Spondylolysis Lysthesis, spondo, spondylolisthesis occurs when vertebrae slip forward on the one below it, often as a result of spondylysis, spondylolysis. This problem causes pressure on the nerve roots, leading to pain in the lower back and into the buttocks. Uh, pain or numbness may also occur in the leg and foot. Spinal stenosis, a narrow, narrowing of the spinal canal, is typically seen in people older than 60 years. This nar narrowing may be caused by infection, trauma, herniated disc, and arthritis and disc de degeneration. Most adults, most adults older than 50 years have some degree of degenerative disc disease, although they may not be symptomatic. Uh, acute back pain usually results from injury or trauma. The patient typically hyperflexes or twists the back during a vehicular crash, or the injury occurs when the patient lifts a heavy object. Obesity plays increased stress on the back uh, muscles and can cause back pain. Smoking has been linked to disc degeneration, possibly caused by constriction of blood vessels that supply the spine. Congenital spine conditions and sc scoliosis uh, can also lead to back discomfort. Older adults are at high risk for both acute and chronic LBP. Small, petite, Euro-American women are at high risk for vertebral compression fractures, which cause severe pain and decreased mobility. Chart 45.1 provides a list of specific factors that can cause this problem in older adults. Health promotion and maintenance. Many of the problems related to the acute, acute back pain can be prevented by recognizing the cause of back pain and taking appropriate preventative measures. For example, good posture, proper lifting techniques, and exercise can significantly decrease the incidence of low back pain. Nurses and other direct care staff members who move and lift patients are at very high risk for LBP. The U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, mandated that all industries develop and implement a plan to decrease muscle musculoskeletal injuries among their workers. 
One way to meet this requirement is, is to develop an ergonomic plan for the workplace. Ergonomics is an applied science in which the workplace is designed to increase worker comfort, thus reducing injury, while increasing efficiency and productivity. An example is equipment designed for office furniture that can help reduce back injuries. Chart 45.2 summarizes various ways to prevent LBP. Chart 45.1, nursing focus on the older adult, factors contributing to low back pain. Changes in support structures, spinal stenosis, uh, hypotrophy of the intraspinal ligaments, or hy hypertrophy of the intraspinal ligaments, and osteoarthritis. Changes in vertebral support and uh, malalignment, that would be scoliosis and lordosis. Vascular changes would be diminished blood supply to the spinal cord or cauda equina uh, caused by arteriosclerosis and blood uh, dyscrasias. And then an intravertebral disc degeneration. Chart 45.2, Patient and Family Education Guide, Prevention of Low Back Pain and Injury. Use proper body mechanics with specific attention to bending, lifting, and sitting. Assess the need for assistance with your household chores or other activities. Participate in a regular exercise program, especially one that promotes back strengthening, such as swimming and walking. Do not wear high-heeled shoes. Use good posture when sitting, standing, and walking. Avoid prolonged sitting or standing. Use a footstool and ergonomic chairs and tables to lessen back strain. Be sure that equipment in the workplace is ergonomically designed to prevent injury. Keep weight within 10% of ideal body, body weight. Um, ensure adequate calcium intake. Stop smoking. If you are not able to stop, cut down on the number of cigarettes or decrease the use of other forms of tobacco. Patient-centered collaborative care assessment. Physical assessment. Clinical manifestations. The patient's primary concern is continuous pain. Some patients have so much pain that they walk in a stiff, flexed posture or they may be unable to bend at all. They may walk with a limp, uh, indicating possible sciatic nerve impairment. Walking on the heels or toes often causes severe pain in the affected leg, the back, or both. Conduct a complete pain assessment as discussed in Chapter 5. Record the patient's current pain score as well as the worst and best score since the pain began. Ask if the pain occurs or gets worse at night or during rest. Determine, determine if a recent injury to the back has uh, occurred. It is not unusual for the patient to say, I just turned around and felt my back go out. Inspect the patient's back for vertebral alignment and for tenderness and swelling caused by muscle spasm. Painful muscle spasm in the back and affected leg is common because the compressed nerve becomes inflamed and irritates nearby muscle tissue. Patients report stabbing continuous pain in the muscles closest to the affected disc. They often describe a sharp burning posterior thigh or calf pain that may radiate to the ankle or toes along the path of one or more spinal nerves. Pain usually does not extend the entire length of the limb. Patients may also report the same type of pain in the middle of one buttock. The pain is often aggravated by sneezing, coughing, or straining. Driving a vehicle is particularly painful. Oh, it's my life. Ask whether paresthesia, tingling sensation, or numbness is present in the involved leg. Uh, both extremities may be checked for sensation by using a pin or paper clip and a cotton ball for comparison of light and deep touch. The patient may feel sensation in both legs, but may experience a stronger sensation on the unaffected side. Those with severe problems may lose both bowel and bladder control from sacral spinal nerve involvement. If the sciatic nerve is compressed, severe pain occurs when the patient's leg is held straight and lifted upwards. Uh, foot, ankle, and leg weakness may accompany lower back pain. To complete the neurologic assessment, evaluate the patient's muscle tone and strength. Muscles in the extremity or in the back atrophy in severe chronic conditions. The patient has difficulty with movement, and certain movements cause more pain than others. Other information may indicate more serious neurologic problems, and or other information that may indi indicate more serious neurologic problems includes a history of fever and chills, recurrent skin or urinary tract infections, progressive motor and sensory loss, and difficulty with urination or having a bowel movement. In addition, patients 
older than 50 years and those with osteoporosis, immunosuppression, long-term use of steroids, or IV drug abuse require more thorough diagnostic studies. Diagnostic assessment. Imaging studies for patients who report mild nonspecific back pain may not be done depending on the nature of the pain. Patients with severe or progressive neurologic deficits or who are thought to have uh, other underlying conditions, e.g. cancer, infection, require a complete diagnostic assessment, uh, x-rays of the spine, magnetic res- resonance imaging, MRI, or a CT scan may be performed with or without contrast media to determine the cause of the pain. Some physicians may request a myelogram, uh, but this test is done less often today. For patients having surgery, some physicians request a discogram of the affected disc, uh, especially when the level of the injury is not certain. Electrodiagnostic testing, such as electromyography or EMG, and nerve conduction studies may help distinguish motor neuron uh, diseases from peripheral neuropathies and uh, radic- radiculopathies or spinal nerve root uh, involvement. These tests are especially useful in chronic diseases of the spinal cord or associated nerves. Chapter 43 describes these tests in more d- detail. Interventions. Management of patients with back pain varies with the severity and chronicity of the problem. Most patients with acute LBP need only a short-term treatment regimen. The healthcare provider starts with conservative measures. If these are unsuccessful, surgery may be needed. Some patients have continuous or intermittent chronic pain that must be managed for an extended period, perhaps for their entire lives. Non-surgical management. Non-surgical conservative management of LBP includes positioning, drug therapy, heat therapy, physical therapy, and weight control. The Williams position is typically more comfortable and therapeutic for the patient with LBP from a bulging or herniated disc. In this position, the patient lies in the semi fowler's position with a pillow under the knees to keep them flexed or sits in a reclining a recliner chair. This position relaxes the muscles of the lower back and relieves pressure of the spinal nerve root. Most patients also find that they have to change positions frequently. Prolonged standing, sitting, or lying down increases back pain. If the patient must stand for a long time for work or other reason, shoe insoles or special floor pads may help decrease pain. A firm mattress or a backboard placed under a soft mattress may provide back support for some patients. A flat position is sometimes helpful for the patient with a muscle injury. However, a flat position may aggravate the pain caused by disc trauma or disease. The healthcare provider prescribes acetaminophen, muscle relaxants, and NSAIDs for acute LBP. Opioid analgesics are no more effective than non-steroidal analgesics and should be avoided if at all possible. If they must be used, the course of therapy should be short to prevent adverse drug uh, events. Short-term oral steroids in tapered doses may be prescribed for some patients to rapidly reduce inflammation. Some patients may need an epidural injection for pain relief. A corticosteroid and an an anesthetic are injected to reduce inflammation in the affected area. During a facet joint injection, Fluoroscopy is used to insert a needle into the epidural space surrounding the facet and a corticosteroid is injected to coat the nerve roots and outside lining of the joints. Patients having chronic back pain may require an anti-epileptic drug or AED such as gabapentin or neurotin and oxycarbazepine or trileptol to treat neuropathic or chronic nerve pain. Most of the drugs in this class can cause hyponatremia or low serum sodium and um, some cause weight gain. Older patients should be monitored very carefully for symptoms of hyponatremia including generalized skeletal muscle weakness, headache, and diarrhea. Uh, Some patients with back pain may have temporary relief from heat application. Heat increases blood flow to the affected area and promotes the healing of injured nerves. Moist heat from heat packs or hot towels applied for 20 to 30 minutes 
at least four times per day is often recommended. Hot showers or baths also are often beneficial. The physical therapist, PT, may provide deep heat therapy such as ultrasound treatments and diathermy. Um, collaborate with the PT to monitor the effects of heat treatment by assessing the patient's skin condition and relief of pain. Some patients may receive phonophoresis, which is the application of a topical drug, e.g. lidocaine or hydrocortisone, followed by continuous ultrasound for 10 minutes. This procedure pushes the medication into the subcutaneous tissue and provides longer-lasting pain relief. The physical therapist also works with the patient to develop an individualized exercise program. The type of exercises prescribed depends on the location and nature of the injury and the type of pain. The patient does not begin exercises until acute, ba uh, acute pain is reduced by other means. Severe specific exercises or several specific exercises for LBP are listed in chart 45.3. Water therapy combined with exercise may be helpful for patients with chronic pain. The water provides muscle resistance during exercise to prevent atrophy. Patient Family Education Guide Typical Exercises for Chronic or Postoperative Low Back Pain Extension Exercises Stomach Lying Lie face down with a pillow under your chest. Lift legs straight up. Alternate, alternate legs uh, may not be tolerated. Um, upper Trunk Extension Lie face down with your arms at your sides and lift your head and neck. Uh, prone push-ups. Lie face down on a mat and keep your body stiff. Push up to extend your arms. Flexion exercises. Pelvic tilt. Lying on your back with your knees bent, tighten your abdominal muscles to push your lower back against the mat. Uh, semi sit-ups. Lying on your back with your knees bent, raise your upper body at a 45 degree angle and hold this position for 5 to 10 seconds. Knee to chest. Lying on your back with your knees bent, tighten your abdominal muscles to push your lower back against the mat. Uh, now bring one or both knees to your chest and hold this position for 5 to 10 seconds. Back to the text. Weight control often helps reduce chronic lower back pain by decreasing the work on the vertebrae caused by excessive weight or excess, excess weight. If the patient's weight exceeds the ideal by more than 10%, caloric restriction is necessary. Health care providers must be sensitive when reinforcing the need for patients to lose weight to prevent or to lessen chronic back pain. When appropriate, the patient is referred to a nutritionist to plan and implement an appropriate calorie-restricted diet plan. Positive reinforcement and self-esteem building are integral to the, to the nutrition plan. Complementary and alternative therapies. The patient may find that other non-traditional and complementary therapies provide short-term pain relief. Patients with low back pain, muscle injuries, or mild nerve involvement may find relief of pain from chiropractic therapies. These therapies involve manipulative maneuvers of the spine to promote alignment and prevent or treat pressure on nerve roots. Distraction, imagery, acupuncture, and music therapy are examples of pain relief therapies for acute and chronic pain. Chapters 2 and 5 describe these techniques in detail. Surgical management. Surgery is usually performed if conservation measures fail to relieve back pain or if neurologic deficits continue to progress. An orthopedic surgeon or neurosurgeon can perform these surgeries. Two major types of surgery are performed. Depending on the severity and exact location of pain, uh, MIS and conventional open surgical procedures. MIS is not done if the disc is pressing into the spinal cord. Uh, or central cord involvement. Preoperative care. Preoperative care for patient preparing for lumbar surgery is similar to that for any patient undergoing surgery. See chapter 16. Teach the patient about techniques to get into and out of bed, turning and moving in bed, sensations such as numbness and tingling that may occur in the affected or in both legs, home care activities and restrictions. Many patients are discharged to home within 24 hours or the next day after surgery. Therefore, before surgery, teach family members or other caregivers uh, how to assist the patient and what restrictions the patient must follow at home. A bone graft is done if the patient has a spinal fusion. The surgeon explains from where the bone for, or the surgeon explains from where the bone for grafting will be obtained. The patient own the patient's own bone is used whenever possible, but additional bone from a bone bank may be needed. The surgeon provides verbal and written information about the type and source of bone for in surgery. Be sure that the patient's signs signs an informed consent form before surgery. While the bone graft heals, the patient 
uh, may wear a back brace for four to six weeks after surgery. In this case, the brace is fitted after or before surgery. Uh, provide information about the importance of wearing the brace as instructed during the healing process, how to take it off and put it on while maintaining spinal alignment, and how to clean it. Operative procedures. Uh, minimally invasive surgeries, MISs, have the advantage of being associated with less muscle injury, decreased blood loss, and decreased post-operative pain. The primary advantage of these surgical procedures is a shortened hospital stay and the possibility of an ambulatory procedure. Spinal cord and nerve complications are also less likely. Several specific procedures are commonly performed. A local anesthetic is given for the percutaneous lumbar disconnectedy, dis, discectomy, also called microendoscopic discectomy, or MED, or percutaneous endoscopic disca, discectomy, or PED. The surgeon also uses fluor fluoroscopy to insert an endoscope or arthroscope next to the affected disc. A special cutting tool or laser probe is threaded through the cannula for removal or destruction of disc pieces that are compressing the nerve root. A newer procedure combines the med with uh, laser thermodiscectomy to also shrink the herniated disc. Inpatient hospitalization is not necessary for this procedure. A microdiscectomy um, involves microscopic surgery uh, directly through a one-inch incision. This uh, procedure allows easier identification of anatomic structures, improved precision in removing small fragments, and decreased tissue trauma and pain. Laser-assisted laparoscopic lumbar discectomy um, combines a laser with modified standard disc instruments inserted through the laparoscope uh, using an umbilical or belly button incision. The procedure may be used to treat herniated discs that are bulging but do not involve the vertebral canal. The primary risks for this surgery are infection and nerve root injury. The patient is typically discharged in 24 hours but may go home the same day. The most common conventional open procedures are discectomy, uh, laminectomy, and spinal fusion. These procedures involve an incision uh, to expose anatomic landmarks for extensive muscle and soft tissue dissection. Major complications include nerve injuries, discitis or disc inflammation, and dural tears, tears in the dura uh, covering the spinal cord, or tears, not tears, dural tears. Ugh. As the uh, name implies, a discectomy is removal of a herniated disc. A laminectomy involves removal of part of the lamina and facet joints to obtain access to the disc space. When repeated laminectomies are performed or the spine is unstable, the surgeon may perform a spinal fusion or arthrodesis to stabilize the affected area. Chips of bone are removed, typically from the iliac crest, or obtained from donor bone and are grafted uh, between the uh, vertebral vertebrae for support and to strengthen the back. Metal implants, usually titanium pins, screws, plates, or rods, may be required to ensure the fusion of the spine. Before closing the, sur before closing, the surgeon may give an intrathecal or spinal dose of morphine to de decrease postoperative pain. Inter interbody cage fusion is a newer spinal implant. A cage-like device is implanted into the space where the disc was removed. Bone graft uh, tissue is packed around the device. Like uh, instrumentation and fusion, the bone graft grows into and around the cage and creates a stable spine at that level. An adjunct for patients for whom fusion may be difficult is the placement of an implantable direct current stimulation, or DCS, device to promote bone fusion. External bone stimulators may also be effective for healing bone fusions. Postoperative care. Postoperative care depends on the type of surgery that was performed. In the post anesthesia care unit or PACU, uh, vital signs and level of consciousness are monitored frequently, uh, the same as for any surgery. Best practices for PACU care are discussed in Chapter 18. Uh, minimally invasive surgery patients go home the same day or the day after surgery with a band aid or steri strips over their small incision. Those having a microdiscectomy. Uh, may also have a clear or gauze dressing over the bandage. Most patients notice less pain immediately after surgery, but mild 
Oral analgesics are needed for pain control while nerve tissue heals over the next few weeks. In collaboration with the he health care provider and physical therapist, teach the patient to follow the prescribed exercise program, which begins immediately after discharge. Patients should start walking routinely every day. Complications of MIS are rare. Conventional open surgery. Early postoperative nursing care focuses on preventing and assessing complications that might occur in the first 24 to 48 hours. Chart 45.4. As for any patient undergoing surgery, take vital signs at least every four hours during the first 24 hours to assess for fever and for hypotension, which could indicate bleeding or s severe pain. Perform a neurologic assess uh, assessment every four hours of particular importance are movement, strength, and sensation in the extremities. Carefully check the patient's ability to void pain in a flat position in bed make voiding difficult, especially for men. An inability to void may indicate damage to the sacral spinal nerves, which control the detrusor muscle in the bladder. Opioid analgesics may also uh, may have also been associated with difficulty voiding. The patient with a discectomy or a laminectomy typically gets out of bed with assistance on the evening of surgery, which may help with voiding. Pain control may be achieved with patient-controlled analgesia or PCA with a morphine. The route is changed to oral administration after the patient is able to take fluids or the next morning. Inspect and teach the family how to check the surgical dressing for blood or any other type of drainage. Clear drainage may mean cerebral spinal fluid or CSF leakage. The loss of a large amount of fluid may cause the patient to report having a sudden headache. Report signs of any damage to the surgeon immediately. <coughs> Bulging at the incision site may be due to a CSF leak or a hematoma, both of which should also be reported to the surgeon. Chart 45.4, best practice for patient safety and quality care. Assessing and managing the patient with major complications of lumbar spinal surgery. Uh, cerebral fluid leakage uh, would be assessment and intervention would be observed for clear fluid on or around the dressing. Report CSF leakage immediately to the surgeon. The patient is usually kept on flat bed rest for several days while the dural tear heals. Um, if it's a fluid volume deficit, you want to monitor intake and output. Monitor drain uh, output, which should not be be more than 250 milliliters in eight hours during the first 24 hours uh, and monitor vital signs carefully for hypotension and tachycardia. That's for fluid volume deficit. Hypotension and tachycardia. Acute urinary retention. Assist the patient to the bathroom or bedside commode as soon as possible postoperatively. Assist male patients to stand at the bedside as soon as possible postoperatively. Paralytic ileus. Monitor for flatus or stool. Assess for abdominal distension, nausea, and vomiting. Fat embolism syndrome, or FES, more common in people with spinal fusion. Um, that would be uh, observe for and report chest pain, dyspnea, anxiety, and mental status changes, particularly common in older adults. Um, note petechiae around the neck, upper chest, buccal membrane, and conjunctiva. Uh, monitor arterial blood gas values for decreased PaO2. And then there's persistent or progressive lumbar uh, radiculopathy or nerve root pain. And that would be uh, assess report pain not responsive to opioids. Document the location and nature of pain. Administer analgesics as prescribed. And infection, e.g. wound, discitis, or hematoma. Monitor the patient's temperature carefully. A slight elevation is normal. Increased temperature elevation or a spike after the second post-operative day is possibly indicative of infection. Report increased pain or swelling at the wound site or in the legs. Uh, give antibiotics as prescribed if infection is confirmed. Use clean technique for dressing changes. Back to text. Empty the surgical drain, usually a Jackson Pratt or Hemovac, and record the amount of drainage every eight hours. The surgeon usually removes the drain in 24 to 36 hours. Correct turning of the patient in bed is especially important. Teach the patient to log roll every two hours from side to side and vice versa. In log rolling, the patient turns as a unit while his or her back is kept as a straight 
as straight as possible. A turning sheet may be used for obese patients. Either turning, meth uh, either turning method may require additional assistance, depending on how much the patient can assist and on his or her weight. Uh, instruct the patient to keep his or her back straight when getting out of bed. He or she should sit in a straight back chair with the feet resting comfortably on the floor. Teach the patient to deep breathe every two hours to prevent uh, telectasis uh, or atelectasis. Hmm. Uh, your alveolar collapse and pneumonia. Until the patient can ambulate independently, he or she wears graduated compression stockings, sequential compression devices, SCDs, or pneumatic compression boots, PCBs, to prevent deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and possibly pulmonary emboli. Older adu adults are especially likely to develop these complications of immobility. When a spinal fusion is performed in addition to a laminectomy, more care is taken with mobility and positioning. The patient uh, may or may not require bed rest for 24 hours with the nurse or unlicensed, unlicensed assistive personnel log rolling him or her every two hours. For the conventional fusion, uh, inspect both the iliac and spinal incision dressings for drainage and make sure they are intact. A brace or other type of thoracolumbar support may be worn when the patient is out of bed, although this is not a common, is com as common today. Remind the patient to avoid prolonged sitting or standing. Community-based care. The patient with back pain who does not undergo surgery is typically managed at home. If back surgery is performed, the patient is usually discharged to home with support from family or significant others. The older adults without a community support system, a short-term stay in a nursing home or transitional care unit may be needed. Um, collaborate with the case manager or discharge planner, patient and family to determine the most appropriate placement. Home care management. Inform the patient and family members or significant other that the patient should have a firm mattress to provide support for the entire ver vertebral column. Uh, a bed board or large piece of plywood placed under a soft mattress may suffice. Under, er, after a conventional open back surgery, the patient may be limited in the number of times he or she is allowed to climb stairs each day. Uh, however, daily walking is encouraged. The patient can usually return to work in four to six weeks, depending on the nature of the job and the extent of, and type of surgery. Some patients may not return for three to six months if their jobs are physically strenuous. Weight that may be lifted is initially limited to five pounds. The amount is gradually increased as healing occurs. Driving is not permitted for several weeks until the surgeon reevaluates the patient. Patients having any of the MIS procedures may resume normal activities within a few days uh, up to three weeks after surgery, depending on the specific procedure that was done and the condition of the patient. He or she may take a, a shower on the third or fourth day after surgery. Uh, teach the patient to remove the outer clear or gauze dressing if any is in place, but leave the stereo strips in place for a week or so until they fall off. Health teaching. The patient with an acute episode of back pain typically returns to his or her usual activities, but may fear a recurrence. Remind the patient that he or she may never have another episode if caution is used. However, continuous or repeated pain can be frustrating and tiring. Uh, encourage the patient and family members to set short-term goals and to take steps toward recovering slowly. After surgery, in collaboration with the nutritionist and physical therapist, instruct the patient to continue with a weight reduction diet if needed, stop smoking if applicable, uh, use m moist heat as needed, perform strengthening exercises as started uh, preoperatively and in the hospital setting. The physical therapist reviews and demonstrates the f principles of body mechanics and muscle strengthening exercises. The patient is then asked to demonstrate these principles, chart 45-5. Uh, formal physical uh, therapy usually begins about two weeks after surgery. Um, teach the patient the importance of keeping all appointments and following the prescribed exercise plan. The health care provider may want the patient to continue taking anti-inflammatory drugs and muscle relaxants. Uh, remind the patient and family about the possible side effects of drugs and what to do if they occur. In a few patients, uh, back surgery is not successful. This situation referred to as failed back surgery syndrome or FBSS 
is a complex combination of organic, psychological, and socioeconomic factors. Repeated surgical procedures often discourage these patients who must continue pain management after multiple operations. Nerve blocks and other chronic pain management modalities may be needed on a long-term basis. See Chapter 5. Uh, Nikon Niconotide, or Prealt, is used for severe chronic back pain and FBBS and is given by intrathecal spinal infusion with a surgically uh, implanted pump. It is the first available drug in a new class called N-type calcium channel blockers or NCCBs. NCCBs seem to selectively block calcium channels on those nerves that usually transmit pain signals to the brain. Uh, niconotide, or no, not niconotide, ziconotide is also used for patients with cancer, AIDS, and unremitting pain from other nervous system disorders. It can be given with opioid analgesics, but should not be given to patients with severe mental health behavioral health problems because it can cause psychosis. If the symptoms such as hallucinations if symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions occur, the drug should be stopped immediately. Hmm. Chart forty five five patients and family education guide use of proper body mechanics to prevent back injury after surgery. Size up the load to determine the number of persons needed to perform the task. Uh, when lifting an object, keep your back straight and do not bend at the waist. Lift with your large thigh muscles. Uh, push objects rather than pull them. Do not twist your back. Avoid prolonged sitting or standing. Use a footstool to lessen back strain. Sit in chairs with good support. Sleep on a firm mattress. Avoid shoulder stooping. Maintain proper posture. Do not walk or stand in high-heeled shoes for prolonged periods for women or men. <laughs> Healthcare resources. Assist the patient in identifying support systems, e.g. family, church, groups, and clubs, after back surgery, or FBSS. For example, a spouse may help the uh, patient with exercises or perform the exercises with the patient. Members of a church group may help run errands and do household chores. The patient with back pain may continue physical therapy on an ambulatory basis after discharge. For unresolved pain, the patient may be referred to pain specialists or clinics, which are usually found in large metropolitan hospitals. A case manager may be assigned to the patient to help with the resource management and utilization. Cervical neck pain. Pathophysiology. Cervical neck pain most often results from a bulging or herniation of the nucleus pulposa, or HNP, and an intra uh, intravertebral disc. As seen in figure 45.1, the disc tends to herniate laterally where the annulus fibrosus is weakest and uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament is thinned. The result is spinal nerve root compression with resulting motor and sensory manifestations, typically in the neck, upper back, over the shoulder, and down the affected arm. The disc between the 5th and 6th uh, cervical vertebrae, C5 and 6, is affected most often. If the disc does not herniate, nerve compression may be caused by osteophyte or bon bony spur formation from osteoarthritis. The osteophyte presses on the inter, uh, intervertebral foramen, uh, which results in a narrowing of the disc and pressures on the nerve root. As with sci sciatic nerve compression, the patient with cervical <coughs> nerve compression may have either continuous or intermittent chronic pain when the disc herniates centrally. Pressure on the spinal cord occurs. When the disc herniates centrally, pressure on the spinal cord occurs. <coughs> Excuse me. Cervical pain, acute or chronic, may also occur from muscle st uh, strain, ligament sprain, resulting from aging or poor posture, living incorrectly or lifting incorrectly, tumor or infection. The type, the typical history of the patient includes a report of pain when moving the neck, which radiates to the shoulder and down the arm. The pain may interrupt sleep and may uh, be accompanied by a headache or numbness and tingling in the affected arm. To determine the exact cause of the pain, the healthcare provider requests diagnostic tests such as MRI, uh, plain x-rays of the neck, 
electromyography, or a combination of these. A discogram may be done to determine the exact level of injury if it is not evident. Patient-centered collaborative care. Conservative treatments for neck pain is the conservative treatment for neck pain is the same as described for low back pain, except the exercises focus on the shoulders and neck. The physical therapist teaches the patient the correct techniques for performing shoulder shrug, shoulder squeeze, and seated rowing. If these treatments do not work, some healthcare providers prescribe a soft collar to stabilize the neck, especially at night. Using the collar longer than 10 days leads to increased pain and decreased muscle strength and range of motion. For that reason, some healthcare providers do not recommend collars for cervical disc problems. If conservative treatment is ineffective, surg surgery may be required, most often using a conventional open surgical approach. A neurosurgeon usually performs the surgery because of the complexity of the nerves and other structures in that area of the spine. Depending on the cause and the location of the herniation, either an, uh, an anterior or posterior approach is, is used. An anterior cervical discectomy infusion, an ACDF, is commonly performed. The patient is fitted with a large brace before surgery. Routine preoperative and postoperative care is the same as that described in six, uh, chapter 16 and 18. The priority care in the intermediate postoperative period is maintaining an airway and ensuring that the patient has no problem with breathing. Swelling from the surgery can narrow the trachea, causing a partial obstruction. Uh, chart 45.6 summarizes best practice for postoperative care and discharge planning. Complications of ACDF can occur from the brace or the surgery itself. The initial brace is worn for six to, uh, four to six weeks, uh, depending on the patient. When it is removed, a soft collar is worn for several more weeks or longer if needed. Potential complications of the anterior surgical approach can be found in chart 45.7. Some patients may be candidates for minimally invasive surgery or MIS such as percutaneous cervical discectomy through an endoscope with or without laser thermodiscectomy to shrink the herniated portion of the disc. The care of these patients is very similar to that for the patient with low back pain who has MIS. See discussion of surgical management of patients with low back pain on page something. Well, I'm going to read a bunch of uh, charts here. Okay, charts. Charts, charts, charts. Chart 45.6, best practice for patient safety and quality care. Care of the patient after an anterior Interior cervical discectomy infusion. Postoperative interventions. Assess airway, breathing, and circulation. ABCs. First priority. Explanation point. Check for bleeding and drainage at the incision site. Um, monitor vital signs and neurologic status frequently. Check for swallowing ability. Monitor intake and output. Assess the patient's ability to void. May be problems secondary to opiates. Manage pain adequately and assist the patient with ambulation within a few hours of surgery if he or she is able. Discharge teaching. Before, be sure that someone stays with the patient for the first few days after surgery. Review drug therapy. Teach care of the incision. Review activity restrictions. No lifting, no driving until phys physician permission, no strenuous activities. Walk every day. Call the surgeon if symptoms of pain, numbness, and tingling worsen or if swallowing becomes difficult. Wear brace or collar per surgeon's prescription. Chart 45.7. Key features. Postoperative complications of cervical discectomy and fusion. Hoarseness due to laryngeal injury may be temporary or permanent. Hmm. Temporary dysphagia. Um, dysphagia may last few days to several months, usually not severe. Uh, esophageal, tracheal, or vertebral um, artery injury, wound infection, injury to the spine, spinal cord, or nerve roots, dura mater tears, or dura mater, dura mater tears with uh, associated cerebral spinal fluid leaks, pseudoarthrosis caused by non union of fusion, and graft and screw loosening if a fusion was performed. NCLEX Examination Challenge. A client returns from the post-anesthesia care unit, PACU, after 
having a cervical lam laminectomy and spinal fusion of C4 and C5. She states that she has a headache and feels nauseated. What is the nurse's first priority when ca caring for client? Sounds like a dur dural matter tear with the CF CSF fluid leaking. So it would be check the dressing for signs of cerebral s fluid leak, establish an airway and listen to breath sounds, give the client pain medication for a headache, place the client in semi fowler's position immediately. I would say check the dressing for signs of cerebral s fluid leak. Okay, spinal cord injury. We're getting there. Here, hold on. Yeah, spinal cord injury. Loss of motor function, mobility, sensation, reflex activity, and bowel and bladder control often result from a SCI, or spinal cord injury. Injury. In addition, the patient may experience significant behavior and emotional problems as a result of changes in body, image, role performance, and self-concept. The SCIs are classified as complete or incomplete. A complete spinal cord injury is one in which the spinal cord has been severed or damaged in a way that eliminates all innervation below the level of the injury. Uh, injuries that allow some function or movement below the level of the injury are described as an incomplete spinal cord injury. Mechanisms of injury. When enough force is applied to the spinal cord, the resulting damage causes many neurologic deficits. Sources of force include direct injury to the vertebral column, um, fracture, dislocation, and sublux subluxation, uh, or partial dislocation, or uh, penetrating trauma like a gunshot or knife wounds. Although in some cases the cord itself may remain intact, at other times the cord undergoes a destructive process caused by a contusion or bruise or compression. The causes of SCI can be divided into primary and secondary mechanisms of injury. Four, four primary mechanisms uh, may result in an SCI. Hyperflexion, hyperextension, axial loading or ver vertical compression, and uh, excessive rotation. Penetrating injuries, or penetrating injuries to the cord may also occur. A hyperflexion injury occurs when the head is suddenly and forcibly accelerated or moved forward, causing extreme flexion of the neck. This type of injury often occurs in head-on vehicle collisions and diving accidents. Flexion injury to the lower uh, thoracic and lumbar uh, spine may occur when the trunk is suddenly flexed on itself, such as occurs in a fall on the buttocks. The posterior ligaments can be stretched or torn or the vertebrae may fracture or dislocate. Either process may damage the spinal cord, causing hemorrhage, edema, and necrosis. Hyperextension. That was hyperflexion, so this is hyperextension. Injuries occur most often in vehicle collisions in which the vehicle is struck from behind or uh, during falls when the patient's chin is struck. The head is suddenly accelerated and, and then decelerated. This stretches or tears the interior longitudinal ligament, fractures or sub subluxates the vertebrae and perhaps ruptures an intervertebral disc. As with flexion injuries, the spinal cord may be easily damaged. Diving accidents, falls on the buttocks, or a jump in which a person lands on the, fe uh, on the feet can cause many of the injuries attributed to axial loading or vertical compression. A blow to the top of the head can uh, cause the vertebrae to shatter. Pieces of bone enter the spinal canal and damage the cord. Rotation injuries are caused by turning the head beyond the normal range. Ah! This hurts reading this stuff. Penetrating injuries to the spinal cord are classified by the speed of the object, e.g. a knife or bullet, causing the injury. Low speed or low impact injuries cause damage directly to the site or local damage to the spinal cord or spinal nerves. In contrast, high speed injuries that occur from gunshot wounds cause both direct and indirect damage. Secondary injury worsens the primary injury. Secondary injuries include hemorrhage, ischemia or lack of blood flow, hypovolemia or decreased circulating blood volume, neurogenic shock, a, a medical mer emergency. Um, the spinal cord may be contused, lacerated, or compressed by the injury. Teschal hemorrhage uh, into the central gray matter and la later into the white matter may result. Um, edema occurs when the cord is um, 
compressed by hemorrhage or bony fragments, hemorrhage and loss of blood vessel tone dilation after severe cord injury may result in hypovolemia. In some patients, especially those with cervical spine injury, a type of hypovolemic shock called neurogenic shock may occur. <coughs> Extent of injury. Uh, incomplete SCIs are more common than complete lesions. A patient experiencing an incomplete lesion typically has a mixed pattern of partial motor, sensory, and reflex function. Specific syndromes result from incomplete lesions. Uh, a pure syndrome may not be seen. Cervical injuries may produce... Okay, so cervical injury injuries may produce anterior cord syndrome or posterior cord syndrome. Uh, Conus, uh, Brown, or Brown Saccard syndrome, or central cord syndrome. Conus medullaris and cauda equinus syndromes are associated with injuries to the lumbar and sacral cord. Anterior cord syndrome results from damage to the anterior, anterior portion of both gray and white matter of the spinal cord, usually as a result of decreased blood supply. Although motor function and pain and temperature sensations are lost below the level of injury, the sensation of touch, position, and vibration remain intact. More than half of patients with this syndrome are older than 40 years, with most between 50 and 70 years. Functional motor control is recovered in some patients with cervical spine injuries. The opposite happens in a rarely encountered posterior cord lesion, which also occurs from damage to the posterior gray and white matter of the spinal cord. Motor function remains intact, but the patient loses vibratory sense, touch, and position sensations. brown saccard syndrome um, results from penetrating injuries that cause a uh, hemisection of the spinal cord or injuries that affect half of the spinal cord, motor function, uh, proprioception or position sense, um, vibration and deep touch sensations are lost on the same side of the body as the lesion or ipsilateral. On the opposite side of the body, contralateral from the injury, the sensations of pain, temperature, and light touch are affected due to spinal nerve tract crossing. Lesions of the central portion of the spinal cord produce a central cord syndrome. Uh, loss of uh, motor function is more severe in the upper extremities than in the lower extremities. Uh, varying degrees and patterns of sensation remain intact damage to the cauda equina or conus medullaris in the lumbar sacral area produces a variable uh, pattern of motor or sensory loss because the peripheral nerves uh, have the potential for recovery and regrowth. In addition, this uh, injury usually results in a neurogenic bowel and bladder in which the patient has problems with elimination. And I think I read way too much, so I don't think we needed any of that uh, spinal cord injury stuff, but hey, you got it anyways. Okay, so sorry about that, um, but on to osteomyelitis. Infection in uh, bony tissue, oh, this is 1164 to 1167. Okay, osteomyelitis. Infection in bony tissue can be a severe and difficult to treat problem. Bony infection can result in chronic or bone infection can result in chronic recurrence of infection, loss of function and mobility, amputation and even death. Pathophysiology: Bacterial uh, viruses or f fungi can cause infection in bone known as osteomyelitis. Invasion by one or more pathogenic microorganisms stimulates the inflammatory response in bone tissue. The inflammatory the inflammation produces an increased vascular leak and edema, uh, often involving the surrounding soft tissues. Once inflammation is established, the vessels in the area become thrombos thrombosed and release exudate or pus into the bony tissue or um, 
Ischemia, ischemia of bone tissue follows the, and results in necrotic bone. This area of necrotic bone separates from surrounding bone tissue and sequestrum is formed. The presence of sequestrum prevents bone healing and causes superimposed infection, often in the form of bone abscess, as shown in figure 53.2. The cycle repeats itself as the new uh, infection leads to further inflammation, vessel thrombosis, and necrosis. Osteomyelitis is characterized or categorized as exogenous, in which infectious organisms enter from outside the body as in an open fracture, or endogenous, in which organisms are carried by the bloodstream from other areas of infection in the body. Endogenous osteomyelitis uh, may also be referred to as uh, hematogenous and hematogenous osteomyelitis. A third category is contiguous, in which bone infection results from skin infection or adjacent tissues. Osteomyelitis can be further divided into two major types, acute osteomyelitis and chronic osteomyelitis. Etiology. Each type of bone infection has its own causative factors. Pathogenic microbes favor bone that has a rich blood supply and a, marrow, and, and a marrow cavity. Acute hematogenous infection uh, results from bacteremia, uh, underlying disease, or non-penetrating trauma. Urinary tract infections, uh, particularly in older men, tend to spread to the lower vertebrae. Long-term uh, IV catheters, e.g. Hickman catheters, can be primary sources of infection. Patients undergo long-term hemodialysis and IV drug abusers are also at risk for osteomyelitis. Salmonella in infections of the GI tract may spread to bone. Um, patients with sickle cell disease and other hemoglobinopathies Globinopathies, um, often have multiple episodes of salmonellosis, which can cause bone infection. Poor dental hygiene and periodontal uh, or gum infection can be a causative factor in contiguous osteomyelitis in facial bones. Minimal non penetrating trauma can cause hemorrhages or small vessel occlusions, leading to bone necrosis. Regardless of the source of infection, many infections are caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Treatment of infection may be complicated further by the presence of methicillin-resistant or Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA or other drug-resistant microorganism, which is becoming very common in hospitalized and institutionalized patients. One of the major outcomes in healthcare settings uh, today is to reduce the number of MRSA infections from any source. Considerations for older adults. Malignant external otitis media uh, involving the base of the skull is sometimes seen in older adults with diabetes. The most common cause of contiguous spread in older adults, however, is found in those who have slow healing foot ulcers. Multiple organisms tend to be responsible for the resulting osteomyelitis. In contrast, penetrating trauma uh, leads to acute m uh, osteomyelitis by direct inoculation. A soft tissue infection may be present as well. Animal bites, puncture wounds, and bone surgery can cause, uh, can result in bone infection. The most common offending organism is Pseudomonas aeruginosus, aeruginosa, uh, but other gram-negative bacteria may be found. If bone infection is misdiagnosed or inadequately treated, chronic osteomyelitis may develop. Inadequate care management results when the treatment period is too short or when the treatment is delayed or inappropriate. About half of cases of chronic osteomyelitis are caused by gram-negative bacteria. Although bacteria are the most common causes of osteomyelitis, virus and fungal organisms also may cause infection. Incidence and prevalence. Hematogenous, gen, hematogenous um, osteomyelitis is the most common type of osteomyelitis. It occurs mo more often in chicken, but is becoming increasingly common in. Did I say chicken? More often in children, but is becoming increasingly common in adults, particularly older adults. Acute infection is more common in children. Chronic infection is more common in adults. 
Men have osteomyelitis more often than women related to a higher incidence of blood, blunt or penetrating trauma. Conditions such as malnutrition, alcoholism, diabetes, kidney or liver disease, and immunosuppressing disorders increase the risk and complicate effective treatment. Bone tissues in the vertebrae and long bones are common sites of infection. The adult with a comprised blood supply is at greatest risk for chronic infection. Advanced, agent, advanced age and concurrent disease may prolong the course of the infection for as long as a year or more. Patient-centered collaborative care. <coughs> Assessment. Uh, bone pain with or without other manifestations is, common, is a common concern of patients with uh, bone infection. The pain is described as a constant, localized, pulsating sensation that worsens with movement. Uh, the patient with acute osteomyelitis has fever, uh, usually with temperature greater than 101 or 38. Um, older adults may not have an extreme temperature elevation because of lower core body temperature and compromised immune system that occur uh, with normal aging. The area around the infected bone swells and is tender when palpated. Uh, erythema or redness and heat may also be present. When vascular compromise is severe, patient may not feel discomfort because of nerve damage from lack of blood supply. When vascular insufficiency is suspected, uh, assess circulation in the distal extremities. Ulcerations may be present on the feet or hands, indicating inadequate healing ability as a result of poor circulation. Fever, swelling, and erythema are less common in those with chronic osteomyelitis. Ulceration resulting in sinus tract formation, localized pain, and drainage is more characteristic to chronic infection. So fever, swelling, and redness with acute ulceration uh, and sinus tract formation, localized pain, and drainage for chronic osteomyelitis. Chart 53.4, key features, acute and chronic osteomyelitis, acute osteomyelitis. Fever, temperature, usually above 101, 38, swelling around the affected area, erythema of the affected area, tenderness of the affected area, bone pain that is constant, localized, and pulsating, intensifies with movement. Chronic osteomyelitis, ulceration of the skin, sinus tract formation. Um localized pain, drainage from the affected area. The patient with osteomyelitis usually has an elevated white blood cell count, uh, which may be double the normal value. In chronic infection, normal values or slight elevations may be seen. Um, the er erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR, may be uh, normal early in the uh, course of the disease, but rises as the condition progresses. It may remain elevated for as long as three months after drug therapy is discontinued. If bacteremia is present, a potentially life-threatening complication that could lead to septic shock, a blood culture identifies the offending organisms to determine which antibiotics should be used in treatment. Both aerobic and anaerobic blood cultures should be collected before therapy is started. Although bone changes cannot be detected early uh, with standard x-rays, changes in blood flow can be seen early in the course of the disease of radionuclide scanning. A bone scan using uh, technetium or gallium is extremely helpful in the diagnosis of osteomyelitis and identifies most cases. In some cases, MRI may be more sensitive than traditional bone scanning in the uh, diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Common nursing diagnosis and collaborative problems. Nursing diagnosis and collaborative problems uh, that may apply to patients with osteomyelitis include uh, acute pain or chronic pain related to inflammation, hyperthermia related to pathogenic invasion of the bone, uh, infect 
ineffective tissue perfusion or peripheral related to tissue swelling and potential for sepsis and septic shock. Interventions. The specific treatment protocol depends on the type and number of microbes present in the infected tissue. If other tissues fail to resolve the infectious process, uh, surgical management may be needed. Surgical management. To re reverse acute osteomyelitis, the healthcare provider starts antimicrobial, e.g. antibiotic, therapy as soon as possible. In the presence of copious wound drainage, contact precautions are used to prevent the spread of the offending organisms to other patients and healthcare personnel. Teach patients uh, visitors and staff members how to use these precautions. See Chapter 25 for discussion of contact precautions. Um, IV antimicrobial therapy is used uh, is usually prescribed uh, for several weeks for acute osteomyelitis. Uh, more than one agent may be needed to combat multiple types of organisms. A hospital or home care nurse gives the drugs at specifically prescribed times so that therapeutic serum levels are achieved. Observe for the actions, side effects, toxicity, and interactions for giving these drugs. Teach family members or other caregivers in the home setting how to uh, administer <coughs> how to administer antimicrobials if they are continued after hospital discharge or are only used at home. The optimal drug regimen for patients with chronic osteomyelitis is not well established for chronic. Um, prolonged therapy for more than three months may be needed to eliminate the infection. Because of the cost of lengthy hospital stays, patients are typically cared for in the home setting with long-term vascular access catheters, such as such as the peripherally inserted central catheter, or PIC, uh, the drug for drug administration. After discontinuation of IV drugs, oral therapy may be needed for weeks or months. Patients and families must understand the complications of inadequate treatment or failure to follow up with health care providers. Teach them that drug therapy must be continued over a long period to be effective. Even when symptoms of the disease disappear to be, uh, or appear to be improved, the full course of IV and oral anti antimicrobials must be completed. In addition to systemic drug therapy, the wound may be irrigated either continuously or intermittently with one or more antibiotic solutions. Use sterile technique at all times. A medical te technique in which beads made of bone cement are impregnated with an antibiotic and uh, packed into the wound can provide direct contact of the antibiotic with the offending organism. Drugs are also needed to control pain. Patients experience acute and chronic pain and must receive a regimen of drug therapy for control. Chapter 5 describes pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions for both acute and chronic pain. If an open wound or ulcer is present in the hospital or long-term care setting, the patient's treatment usually includes standard precautions for limited infections in which the wound is not draining but is covered. This practice may vary according to healthcare agency policy. Contact precautions are reserved for more severe infections, particularly when the purulent material uh, cannot be adequately contained by a dressing. Cover the open area and use clean technique when dressings are changed to prevent further co contamination. The previous clinical practice was to use strict aseptic technique, but most agencies are now using clean technique for contaminated or dirty wounds. Wounds may be managed through the window of a cast, uh, which must remain dry during dressing or irrigation procedures. Teach patients and family how to continue clean dressing procedures at home. A treatment to increase tissue perfusion for patients with chronic, unremitting osteomyelitis is the use of a hyperbaric chamber or portable device uh, to administer hyperbaric oxygen or HBO therapy. These devices are usually available in large tertiary care centers and may not be accessible to all patients who might benefit from them. 
With HBO therapy, the affected area is exposed to a high concentration of oxygen that diffuses into the tissue to promote healing. In conjunction with high-dose drug therapy and surgical debridement, HBO has proved very useful in uh, treating a number of anaerobic uh, infections. Other wound management therapies are described in Chapter 27. Surgical management. Antimicrobial therapy alone may not meet the de desired outcome of treatment. Surgical techniques may be used to minimize the disfigurement that can be devastating or devastating result of s severe osteomyelitis. Surgery is reserved for patients with chronic osteomyelitis. Because bone cannot heal in the presence of necrotic tissue, a sequestrectomy may be performed to debride the necrotic bone and allow revascularization of tissue. The excision of dead and infected bone often results in a sizable cavity of bone defect or bone defect. The use of bone grafts to repair bone defects is also widely used. When infected bone is extensively resected, reconstruction with microvascular bone transfers may be done. This procedure is reserved for larger skeletal defects. The most common donor site for the patients are the patient's fibula and iliac crest. The bone graft may have an attached, attached muscle or skin flap, if necessary. The steps of the procedure are similar to those of bone grafting in that debridement of dead or necrotic bone is done before bone transfer. Nursing care of the patient after surgery is similar to that of for any post-operative patient, see chapter 18. However, the important difference is that neurovascular or NV assessments must be done frequently because the patient experiences increased swelling after the surgical procedure. Elevate the affected extreme extremity to increase venous uh, return and thus control swelling. So elevate the extremity. Okay. Assess the document. Assess, assess and document the patient's NV status, including pain, movement, sensation, warmth. <laughs> temperature, um, distal pulses, and cap refill. Uh, not, cap refill is not as reliable as the above indicators. Check for signs of neurovascular compromise, including pain that cannot be controlled, paresis or paralysis, weakness or inability to move, paresthesias or abnormal tingling sensation, pallor, and pulselessness. If any of these findings occur, report them immediately to the surgeon. If the bony defect is small, a muscle flap may be the only surgery required. Local muscle flaps are used in the treatment of chronic osteomyelitis when soft tissue does not fill the dead space or cavity, resulting from bone debridement. The flap provides wound coverage and enhances blood flow to, the, to promote healing. A split thickness skin graft is often applied several days after the muscle flap. When the previously described surgical procedures are not appropriate or successful and as a last resort, the affected limb may need to be amputated. The physical and psychological care for a patient who has undergone an amputation is discussed in Chapter 54. For all the surgical procedures and the recovery phases, long-term antimicrobial treatment is necessary. The preoperative and postoperative nursing care is similar to that for repair of musculoskeletal trauma and is also discussed in Chapter 54. And that's osteomyelitis.